Welcome to the Haney Biz Project with Mark Haney. Mark is a serial investorpreneur and the chief dreaming officer of the Haney Biz Companies. He's working tirelessly to ignite the entrepreneurial revolution and share the inspiring stories of the region's most influential leaders. And now, here's Mark Haney. All right, all right, all right. This is the Haney Biz Project, and we are on a mission to ignite the entrepreneurial revolution right here in our hometown of Sacramento, trying to help the entrepreneurs out a little bit through storytelling, right? We tell the good stories, the stories about winning, and it is not always easy. Sometimes along the road in these stories, in fact, I would say in every entrepreneurial journey, in every entrepreneurial story, there is this turning point, right? Where you start off your business and everything seems so great. It's going to, we're going to kill it. We've got these huge dreams. And then somehow it, it, you discover it is not so easy and you hit this, uh, this wall or this turning point. I think every story uh, faces this, uh, this opportunity uh, where the entrepreneur has to make a decision, has to figure out a way to overcome. I am here today with Mr. Greg Van Dusen to help me share the stories today. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's, you know, having you in here today, uh, you're, uh, you're here uh, replacing pitch inning for my main man, Marcus Haney. And I usually say to Marcus, Marcus, are you, are you hanging or are you banging? And when I say that, when we're banging, we're at our very best. Marcus is not doing too well today. He's got bronchitis. How are you doing? You're doing pretty well. Your hand is messed up there, I see. It's nothing. Uh -huh. You know, that, that's just a little thing. I, I, I love working. I love working fast. I love producing. Uh, it's banging, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so being at our very best, though, I mean, we it, throughout the day, you know, we ask in our, in our newsletter, our, our revolution, um, why, what happened to the attitude of failure is not an option? It seems today that in entrepreneurship and in life, even in, in, in sports, you know, it's okay to be mediocre and failure is okay now. Is that right? You know, it all happened when they stopped keeping score in T-ball. Ah, uh, that was That's the turning point. What year was down. that? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> that was kid number two. Uh, you, know, you know, everybody needs to feel encouraged. We talk about this a little bit uh, as this show goes on, but it, it seems to me that, that, you know, there's two different kinds of failure, right? I fail every day. My wife will tell you right now, I fail every day. My people, my team here, mistakes happen all the time. And, and we can look at these mistakes as, uh, as catastrophic or we can learn from them. But it also seems like it's becoming okay to fail as a business but as a business goes into these really difficult times and contemplates a uh, complete disaster going out of business I mean it's not okay to fail at that time is it Greg no it's it's never okay to fail it's okay to make mistakes but you got to own them and then you got to get up and dust yourself off you know the kind of errors you the kind of mistakes you got to uh, avoid are failed mistakes and the errors that come from not doing anything yeah. the errors of omission the errors of commission are all right as long as you learn from them uh, yeah you've got to learn but i mean it seems to me that if you think back to um, the toughest times that we have in our life especially as entrepreneurs right owning your own business comes with a certain kind of stress i mean you have have uh, uh, mouths to feed. Sure, you have your family at home, like everybody has the family that that's worried about uh, you know making sure that mom or dad is successful in their venture. But I mean, you've got your teammates, right? When when a business goes out of business, what happens to the team? What happens to the employees? What happens to the people that are expecting to get paid? It's tough. You know, we have some friends, and I won't name them right now, but they recently had to downsize by forty yeah. percent. And I don't know if they feel any better than their employees who they had to let go. It's awful. It takes a toll. And I think that some people, when they get to that point, they say, forget it. You know, I, I, it's time to hang it up. And other people find a way to dig a little bit deeper, find a way to find something inside themselves to push through. And, you know, sometimes that takes a toll on the marriage. Sometimes that takes a toll on the health. Sometimes that it takes a different kind of person to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is, is built to be an entrepreneur. Would you agree? I would 100% agree. But those who decide to, to endure and persevere – they get better, they get stronger, and they have more faith because they know they can do it because it usually yeah. turns out to be a win. Yeah, very true, Greg. And I think that uh, that's what this show is about is those winning stories. If you think about 
when an entrepreneur wins, when an entrepreneur finds a way to persevere, to dig a little bit deeper, maybe they have to downsize, uh, you know, shrink to grow even in, yeah. in uh, two steps uh, forward, uh, maybe three steps back occasionally. When that happens, when they figure out a way to begin moving forward again, begin finding a way to get over the hump, I mean, lives change. What does that do for our family, our friends, our community of Sacramento? That's These stories are are the ones that uh, I think inspire people. So that's the goal of this show is really to inspire people. You can do it too, um, to educate people a little bit on business and how it works, but also hopefully help you feel a little bit connected, right? If you hear the stories of guys like are coming on the show today, right? We have Bill McAnally coming on the show today. Bill McAnally, Bill McAnally Racing's coming up after the break. Um, a little bit later in the show, we're going to have uh, Doug uh, Doug Wageman is coming on the show. He's with Wageman, Cochran Funeral Homes, right? These guys come on the show, tell their stories. That inspires us. That makes it make us feel like, you know what? If these guys can do it, maybe I can do it too. Greg? Absolutely right. I want to give a shout out to Tim Berry, Barrico Redwood of Berry Lumber. He was going to be on the show today. He's one of the great guys ever, but he's sick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that flu is whoa. knocking people down. To Nasty. try to build a business, Barry Redwood, right? Any of our businesses, when you try to do it sick, you try to do it when you're not feeling good, it is not easy. I was in Cabo last week with my wife, and uh, we, you know, the, half the people got sick. I was one of the ones that didn't get sick, and I was, you know, on my phone and doing my own thing, kind of in my world, and maybe even being a little bit of a germaphobe. And uh, and my wife gets me a card, and she said, I open it up, and it says, "Get better soon." And I was the one that wasn't sick. It was kind of odd, you know, when she did that. But, you know, I thought about it. She was right. I've got to be uh, more attentive. i got to live in the present. i got to get off my phone and get into the relationships. And, you know, she keeps me humbled every day, as she did in Cabo, because I fail, as she will tell you, just about every day. So uh, I want to invite the uh, listeners to join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com, brought to you courtesy of Five Star Bank. This is the Haney Biz Project. Now, back to the Haney Biz Project with host Mark Haney. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of Comstock's Magazine and California Backyard. I'm Mark Haney, and I'm joined by Bill McAnally, Sacramento's motorsports guru. How you doing, Bill? I'm doing good, Mark. I appreciate you coming on the show again. And when, when you come on the show, you always do one thing that I, I really appreciate. You bring gifts. You brought these signed hats from, uh, from NASCAR uh, and Toyota. And, I mean, it is uh, – that's what you do, man. You're a generous guy. Well, those aren't just signed. That's Todd Gilliland, the two-time champion. Wow. He'll very be racing cool. on Sundays. He uh, called in, I think, at our last show. And since he did, he's really went on to excel, hasn't he? He's done a great job. We had a, a tremendous year last year. I won 17 of 27 races. He brought home the championship. His two teammates finished second and third in the points. So wow. it was about as good a year <laughs> as you kid. Bill McAnally's team is like, you guys are one of the best, if not the best in the country. But, but back up a second. I don't think everybody knows about the Bill McAnally story. Can you give us an overview of the organization? Well, what we all love doing is the racing, of course, and we develop young drivers when they win their championship, their local racing, and they kind of get to the top of their local racing. The next thing is to start tour racing. So we're that rung in the ladder. We take them from their local surroundings. Mm -hmm. Usually they've been in a family team with their mom, dad, uncle, grandpa, and they come into our organization and we go road course racing, short track racing. We go to the the big tracks like Loudon, Dover, Iowa, put them on a big super speedway mile, mile and larger tracks. Okay. So we develop them, and what they're learning in our cars, the chassis components in our NASCAR K&N cars are the same as those in the trucks, Xfinity, and Cup. So when they're learning they need a bigger sway bar or a bigger right front spring or dropping the pan hard bar, the things they're learning in our cars – help them take those next steps in NASCAR so they can communicate. Well, we all think about the business of professional sports, and I think about uh, the River Cats as, uh, as compared to the, the Giants, right, the minor league system. Is that what this is for, uh, for NASCAR? 
great example. We are the River Cats of NASCAR racing. Okay. Exactly. Well, and you're doing it right here out of Sacramento, out of Roseville, California. And, you know, and, and these, these people are uh, racing all over the country and having entrepreneurial success and racing su success all over the country. So these drivers really are entrepreneurs in the making um, as they build their brand. But let's talk about the rest of your organization, so, just so we have kind of an overview of what, it all, what it's all about. Well, they, uh, the, the racing, like I said, is a near dear what we love to do, but we've got two automotive repair shops. We've got one in Antelope and one at Roseville, right at the old Lumberjack across from Roller King. We've got right. a 16-bay automotive repair shop. We work on all makes and models. We've got a promotions business where our sponsors, Toyota, Napa, our corporate sponsors, to get them into markets they want, a lot of times it'll be a county-owned facility, much like Placer County Fairgrounds is, Nobody wanted to take the risk of bringing a nationally televised NASCAR K&N race into the city of Roseville to Placer County Fairgrounds. So we rent the facility because our sponsors want to be here. It's a strong market for them, and we promote the race. I've got a promotion team that, that does that. So that's a big piece. This year we'll be promoting four races. Actually just had a meeting with the county supervisors and uh, Placer Valley Tourism, and it looks like I've got a contract sitting in my desk. We very well could be taking over All American Speedway for wow. 15 years. I know you've been working on that. It looks like it could be coming together. Um, you think about the the life of an entrepreneur, right? You got a guy that's built this incredible business with uh, multiple divisions, if you will. How do you decide where to allocate the Bill McAnally time? <laughs> <laughs> I try to build a team of the best people I can find, and that's where my success is. It's in my people, and I surround myself, just like you, Mark, with the very best people you could find, and when we have a hiccup, it leaves me free to jump in there. Okay. It might be my auto care. It might be my racing, but I try to build my programs where there's somebody that's responsible for every facet, okay. and then I'm there to back it up, or if we start getting lacking a little in something, I'll get in there and nose around and figure out why and try to make it better. But it sounds like it also, you know, by having the right team around you, it puts you in position to chase opportunities like what you're doing out at the Placer County Fairgrounds, right? That is an enormous opportunity, a regional game changer uh, as you make that happen. So you're able to go, I guess it would take a lot of uh, the Bill McAnally uh, finesse and brain power to make that type of thing happen. I mean, well, it's you can't just, do that if you're turning the wrench, right? No, exactly. And when my people are doing their job right and we don't have problems, that's exactly what it does. I, I go look for the next opportunity and we hire. We've got 43 employees now. I, I worked for a utility company locally for 13 years. I never imagined I'd have 43 two employees, never less 43. Uh -huh. But when they're doing their job right, they're doing a good job. It leaves me a little stir crazy and I go find the next opportunity. So you're working for a utility company and let's walk, walk me through this. Okay. You're working for a utility company. You decide to uh, take on your passion of racing. What happens when you first start? What happened? Well, we struggled. I mean, I worked at the utility company. I worked overtime and side jobs, building the money to race at one time. I was racing. I got audited because I spent a half million dollars racing, but I was only making 60000 a year working for the utility company. It didn't, didn't make sense. So they got into my books, and I needed to explain to them, and I needed to quickly show them that there was an opportunity to make a lot of money racing, or they weren't going to they, – they were wanting a lot of money from me. So we, uh, we did that. But it, it was a struggle at first, Mark. There was times I actually thought about quitting racing, and probably the thing that helped me the most – was in 1998, I got out of the race car after racing myself for about 12 years. And when I got out of the race car and took it to a business and started building cars and coaching people and crew chiefing people, it took our business to another level. And I was able to quit my job at the utility company the very next year. Okay, so when you got out of the car, started bringing on the team, that was the turning point. You, uh, you quit the job, you're going full-time in, but even scaling from there, right, these different divisions, I, I like to think of uh, nobody goes through life undefeated, right? All of us fail. I fail every day. We, Lord knows I, uh, I make mistakes on a daily basis basis. Um, but in most businesses, just about everybody I've talked to who's been successful as an entrepreneur, they 
they come across, I call it like the slow motion moment, right? It's the, it's the time where you're like, what am I going to do? Am I going to take this direction or this direction? Because right now things are not working like they need to work. Have you ever been like a, on the brink of failure in business and had to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was at a point where I almost completely quit racing at one time because I was burning the candle at both ends trying to get it done. I actually had my tractor trailer stolen and uh, it was taken out to the rice fields by the river, and they rummaged through it and dumped over our, our fuel can and lit it on fire and burnt it to the ground to cover their tracks. I mean, they took a fraction of what I spent years and years building and just burnt the rest down to cover their tracks, and that was a kick in the gut. I'll tell you yeah. that if I was ever going to quit, that's the closest I got. But very quick, Mark, I started getting support from the community, from sponsors, from friends, and I didn't want to let people down. I was getting parts and pieces. I got calls from cup teams back east that heard about our our incident and wanted to help us and wow. were donating parts. And once I saw that support, that energized me. And I didn't want to let the people that believed in me, I didn't want to let them down. Well, it makes you think about that, Bill. You, you've, you're a racer. It's a competitive industry. Everybody uh, is out to, uh, to be number one. And you have this uh, incredible setback. You, loo- you, you get your car stolen. You're at the brink of uh, catastrophe. And then the community rallies around you. Why? Just, I mean, we've always tried to do the right things, you know. You being involved in the community, helping the night before I was at a Pinewood Derby for the Cub Scouts with my race car. The kids were sitting in it, climbing around it, you know, and that's, uh, it's just trying to do the right things. I think when you do the right things, it's going to come back to you. Yeah. Amazing how that works. And you found a way to leverage sponsorship in a way that uh, some uh, don't understand. Tell us about your relationship with your sponsors and, and how, how that might relate to other people in the way they think of their business. Well, it's, I I get young racers all the time that ask me, how do you get sponsors? And honestly, if you can't get them, you're not going to be able to take care of them. But it's all about realizing what they're trying to accomplish. They, they, having their name on the race car, it's, it's hard to go into the door and get you excited about having your name on my race car. But if I could say, hey, I'm going to help you increase your sales by 15%. Okay. Or I got some ideas to help you drive sales or for some new business. Or I've got a business-to-business opportunity for you. Then all of a sudden, I've got their attention. And they're as excited as I am and as passionate as I am because it's helping them achieve their dream, too. And that, that's what it's all about. I had a vice president in Napa tell me way back when I first got in with Napa 28 years ago. I've had them for a corporate sponsor. And when you research corporate sponsorship in motorsports, right now there's one team that's had a sponsor longer than we've had Napa Auto Parts. And that's uh, Budweiser with uh, Bernstein. They went 31 years. So I'm hoping to pass uh-huh. that. That's a personal goal. Yeah. And uh, we've got an amazing relationship. And like I said, the vice president for Napa shared with me that, Bill, we love your race and we love what you're doing. We love your enthusiasm and your passion. But if you help us sell auto parts, we'll continue our relationship. So it got me thinking. I was a young man at that time. and I'm, How can I help them sell auto parts? So we started doing ticket programs where people, if they bought parts or came in as a customer, they'd get tickets. We built a two-seater ride car where they could earn rides in our ride car. We'd do storefront showings and shop showings with our race cars, and they'd have to do certain things to earn those incentives, and it was helping Napa achieve their goal. They were selling parts because of our program, so they continue to sponsor us 28 wow. years now. Uh, it's such a it's such a place where people want to be, right? The branding that can happen in professional sports is, is amazing. Well, thinking about professional sports, right? I'm wearing my Niner uh, shirt today and you and I are both Niner fans. I did not go to any, I've got eight season tickets to the Niners and I didn't, I didn't go to a game last year. Um, when I walk into your office over there in Roseville, right? It's not an office. It's a, uh, it, it's a huge uh, facility. Um, there's, you've got one gigantic room dedicated to the 49ers. What is that all about? Well, the Niners, near and dear to me, that's what brought me. I grew up in Ukiah, graduated from Ukiah High, and I came over talking to the coach here. I was on my way up to College of the Redwoods in Humboldt is where I was headed, and I came and talked to Rex Chapel here, mm-hmm. and he said, you know what? I'll, I'll introduce you to a guy, and I'll get you a job with the 49ers if you come to Sierra and play uh, football. We were sitting over at Shakey's Pizza in Rock, <laughs> right real close to here, yeah. right down the road back then. And uh, that summer, 17 years old, I loaded my pickup up, 
and uh, came here and went to work for the 49ers and spent the next three summers working for the Niners and being around that championship organization, seeing how hard they worked, how they prepared, how they were organized. That's helped make me the person I am today. Yeah. Well, you've got uh, you've got quite a facility over there, but you know, I didn't go to any games this year. And I think what got me not as excited was all this uh, political drama associated with uh, the Niners specifically, but even the NFL. I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to take a year off. I gave away all my tickets this year. And it's like, but ne- but next year with Garoppolo coming in, it's like, okay, I'm reignited. The, the 49er faithful in me is coming back out. I don't hear as much about the politics and the Niners look like they're investing in some new players. So I'm like, you know what? The patriotism that, uh, that NASCAR and racing has, it's like, if we could bring that to the NFL, we would really have something special. It, it would be, and it, it's just turned into such a money game, and yeah. you know the the way things are. I've felt the same way as you, and it's uh, it's sad that we feel that way about a team that we've supported and been loyal to for so long. But yeah. I'm with you. I'm excited. I'm pumped up. We're Me ready too. for a great Niner year. Looking next forward year. to going and see some uh, professional uh, athletes run into each other and uh, some real football, and less about all the drama. Well. Uh, Bill, again, I thank you for coming on the show. We're going to uh, ask you to stick around, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what it's like to be an entrepreneur, what it's like to go through the tough times and survive them. Um, and so I have you take a little bit of, bra- of a break here, but when we come back, we're going to have Mr. Doug Wageman. He is the president of a funeral, and he's the funeral director of Cochran Wageman. He's the owner of Cochran Wageman Funeral Services. Join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com, courtesy of Audi Rockland. This is... The Haney Biz Project. Welcome back to Mark Haney, igniting the entrepreneurial revolution with the Haney Biz Project. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of Hub International and Legion AVS. I'm Mark Haney, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Doug Wageman, President, Funeral Director, Owner of Cochran Wageman Funeral Funeral Directors. Thanks for coming on the show today, Well, thank you, Mark. I remember uh, when we actually played your beginning song at a funeral. You Really? The Revolution, right? Back about three Uh, years ago. That's that's inspiring. You know, (laughs) in my age, I've been to uh, too many funerals. But if I if I so go to a, I. Yeah. yeah well okay <laughs> how many funerals do you go to uh, let's just call it a year a lot uh, would and that be like a hundred I would say uh, you know given what's happening uh, in Placer County surrounding area it's it's less and less every year we're okay. talking about a cremation rate of about eighty two percent here in Placer County okay so when it's uh, cremation it it's doesn't different. necessarily mean a service okay gotcha yeah. okay yeah. so that's like a trend people are Absolutely. going less for the service and more for the cremation exactly so and what happens in a cremation if you uh, what do you what what happens to your uh, remains and to the uh, the party that needs to get thrown to celebrate you that is when we the entrepreneur entrepreneur can really uh, come into play. Uh, there are so many things that can happen. There's a lot of options. Uh, we, th- obviously, they can be buried. They can be scattered. They can actually be used uh, in glass to make, or, or clay to make pottery. Okay. Some people actually put it in oils and pastels and, and uh, paint pictures. Who of their decides loved one. all this stuff? Who comes up with all these ideas? Is that the person, the, 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 the family member of the person that's it comes dying? comes from everywhere. Okay. You know, I've even heard of uh, some people that would take little minute par- uh, particles of cremated remains, put it in tattoo ink, and put a picture of mom <laughs> on their shoulder. Wow, that I mean, that sounds. And, what's we, can, it cre- and we can actually make a diamond now. There's mm-hmm. five companies in the world that, if I send cremated remains, we can make an actual diamond. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what is there one that stands out that's the craziest one you've ever heard of? I mean, those sound pretty. But I've never heard of those before. You know, I can't think of. I'm anything challenging that's, you uh, there a little bit. You come up with two <laughs> awesome ones. I asked my wife, you know, what should I ask Doug when he comes on the show? And mm-hmm. see, uh, for my audience here, my wife. Uh, some of you know that uh, when my wife turned 50. She, we decided to do, she decided to do 50 things that she had never done before. And so, you know, and this, they needed to be meaningful. And so we did stuff like we went to, uh, we went to New York when the uh, Times Square, the, when the ball dropped. Uh, that was a big one. We did all kinds of things. But the one thing that we did as relates to you is we planned our funerals yes. all the way down to deciding where we're going to live uh, out our uh, remaining years. Right. And we right. went. 
and we went to Doug, and we and we got taken care of. So uh, I really wish more families would do that. Yeah. Uh, the most difficult thing that we have to deal with on a daily basis are working with families who have just experienced a death, have never had that conversation. <sighs> Yeah, And at that point in time, everybody's confused or angry. They're tired. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. And that's the worst possible time to have to do. And really, who that, should that be thing. making the decision for what happens to you when you pass away? I mean, it should be, uh, it should be pre-decided. You should probably be influencing that you decision, right? You should probably right? have a part in that discussion. Yeah, right. And so <laughs> afterwards, the kids or the siblings or the cousins deciding, everybody, it's a group decision. And, you know, and, and usually the people that are closest with the person that dies, I have to imagine... They want no part of that decision. They want to go grieve and, and think about other things. But yet, these are important decisions. It, it really is. And, and situations like that, it brings the, the worst in people. It brings out the best in people. I've, I've seen the whole gamut over 43 years of doing yeah. this. But going back, you know, we, we mentioned Cochrane and Wageman, but with an 82% cremation rate, back three years ago, I started the Cremation Society of Placer County. Okay. Just for direct cremations and for those families that want something other than a what we would call call a traditional burial. Well, I can't remember what we decided to do. So I'm going to be buried over uh, right next to Roseville High School. There's a funeral there, or excuse me, a, a cemetery, uh, a cemetery there. there. District cemetery. Right, and yeah. I'm going to be kind of, there's really close to the football field. I got right. a corner lot right next to the football field, so I'll be able to hear what's going on on Friday nights. Um, and then I we bought it, we got a discount, though, because we, we bought one plot, and my wife's going to get cremated, and she's going to be put on top of the me. The second right of interment. So is, that, yep. is that common? Yep. That, that is save a little more... bit of cash uh, on, the, on the real estate? And, well, maybe uh, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can take it and reinvest it. And then what <laughs> happens to her? I mean, she gets dumped in there uh, on top of me. Uh, is, there a, is there a big party for her? I, there can be. Okay. There can be. There, there, there's a lot of people that are having, you know, just, you know, private little events. Some of the most cathartic things I'm seeing now, rather than what I would consider to be two, you know, we, we used to call them two songs and a prayer funerals. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the most cathartic things I'm seeing now are when family members just get together at mom's favorite restaurant. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, and just sit around and talk about mom, the good times, the bad times, laugh, cry, and mm -hmm. uh, just be. Mm -hmm. And uh, for them to actually put it on themselves, I have found, and there's a lot of funeral directors like, like to take me behind the barn when I say uh. this, but whatever's going to be the, the, the most healthy for the family to help yeah. them in the grieving process, man, that's what I want to be a part of. Yeah. It, well, it really makes me think it. about, you know, I, like I said before, I've, I've gone to a number of funerals. I've been to a number of them. I've had two of my all-time favorite baseball coaches had their mm -hmm. funerals at, at Cochran and um, Cochran, Wa uh, Wageman Cochran. But what's the etiquette when you go to a funeral? I mean, I'm one of these guys that uh, thinks that it's a serious time. I see other people uh, laughing and joking. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of a... An etiquette that's expected when you go to a funeral? I think you have to uh, keep in mind, you know, who the family is and, and what their style has been. You know, I remember a funeral where they insisted that everybody, including the funeral directors, come in shorts and Hawaiian shirt and, right. and flip-flops. Wow. And so there we are. Yeah. You know, and, and you, I can't say anymore that there is a specific way of doing things. I think the key to anything in any business is meet the customer where they're at, meet the family where they're at, talk with them, and then adapt. Yeah. You know, be the resource, provide the options, and then, and, you know, give the love to the family yeah. or to the customer. Yeah, to and the customer. We could all learn that no matter what business you're in. Well, you think about that. You know, the funeral business is a business, and you, you mm -hmm. bought into the business, right? You were in the corporate uh, land, and then you decided to go entrepreneurial. What right. happened? Well, it, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting story. I, you know, I was with a corporation for 10 years that uh, had uh, hundreds of funeral homes, and I was responsible for 43 of them in five states. But I remembered this one day, it was actually here in Roseville, where I started getting chest pains. And of course, uh, wanting to save money, instead of calling 911, 
I drove myself to uh, okay. Center Roseville ER. Uh, come, please don't do that yeah, to anybody do listening, this. but go ahead. Doug. Don't do that at home. I was a trained prof- No, not really. Uh, um, but uh, it turned out to be a pulmonary embolism. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, you know, right then you start to start thinking about what's really important in life. But I took a year off. Okay. We dissolved the, uh, the, the, the clot and things like that. And I was about ready to go back into corporate. And I started thinking man, do I really want to go back into this, you know, with its set of issues and things like that. So I, out of a whim, I contacted the corporation and I said, you know, that little funeral home in Roseville, you know, that uh, Cochran uh, Chapel of the Roses place, I said, it's not really, you know, meeting our overall corporate strategic objectives. Because again, you know, it's a publicly held mm-hmm. company. We have stockholders and we got objectives. Right. I said, you know what you ought to do? You got to sell that little thing to me, and you'll never see me again. Within 48 hours, there was a divestiture wow. package on my front, on Amazing. front door. Amazing. It's usually the other way around, right? Yeah. The corporate guy is gobbling up the little guy. Exactly. This time we had the little guy take a exactly. piece of the corporate guy. But it was the best thing that ever happened. I have never been happier in my life, and I'll tell you why. There's a, while people say that you have a lot of freedom, there's probably not as much as people think. However, the thing is... With all the problems, we have a different set of issues as a business owner, as you well know, and Bill knows, and all your guests know. But you know what? They're your issues. You get to deal with them. And you know what? That's kind of fun. I'm contacted almost every Wednesday to Thursday by a friend who wants to take me out golfing every Friday. Every Friday morning, he goes golfing. He wants me to drop everything, and Friday morning. Why not? (laughs) You know, in theory, (laughs) it's great. You know, and in the old paradigm, hey, yeah, you're a business owner, yeah, you know, you go. But, you know, if you really love what you do, you know, quite frankly, owning a business, owning your own business, growing your own business is, is probably the, the best competitive sport there is, yeah. number one. And number two, strategic game. I love chess. Yes. But you know what? Owning your own business, doing your own thing, making things grow, that's the best multi-dimensional chess game I think there is. Uh, well, you know, What's I think about, about that? Uh, that is a tremendous commercial for entrepreneurship, which, which is what we're trying to promote on this show. We're, you know, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. We all know that it's mm-hmm. a full contact sport. There's failure that happens. Uh, there's risk associated. It's not for everybody. But when we come back from the break, we're going to hear more about your story. We're going to bring mm-hmm. Bill back in and talk about what it's like mm-hmm. to be an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. the good, the bad, the ugly, and uh, what you love. Love so much about it in the way uh, I know it's chess, but uh, I know it's uh, it's about winning in chess. I have a feeling uh, when we return, I'm going to bring back Doug and Bill McAnally. Join the revolution at HeyBiz.com, courtesy of the Entrepreneurs Organization of Sacramento and law firm Greenberg Trorg. This is the Haney Biz Project. <laughs> And now, back to the Haney Biz Project with investorpreneur Mark Haney. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courtesy of accounting firm Clifton Larson Allen and DCA Capital. I'm Mark Haney, and I am rejoined by both Doug Wageman and Bill McAnally. We've been talking entrepreneurship. Uh, we last talked to Doug, and we were talking about what it's like to uh, buy and grow a funeral business. And, and you told me during the break that next time you're going to bring a gift. See, Bill comes in with these <laughs> gifts signed by famous people. And Doug, you didn't... I didn't, you, get, I didn't uh, get, yeah, get the memo. Uh, yeah, so memo. we're going to have to work on you. Um, but but uh, uh, tomorrow I will be bringing a urn. Okay. Un- 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 <laughs> Unfilled. Unused urn. <laughs> okay. And uh, we'll see if we can't uh, have some candy in or something like that. I so w- you'll have something for your guests. All right. So. Maybe uh, I will put Bill's hat right next to your urn. <laughs> and uh, I will think of you uh, as I walk through my office, as yeah. we walk through Mark Tank. I'll think of my, my two buddies from Roseville building businesses. But we're talking about building businesses, Bill, right? And it's not always easy. There's failure. There's tough times. What would you say to entrepreneurs out there? There, who are who are maybe facing that uh, that turning point where, gosh, it's not working. I might have to make a change. What should what should they be thinking about right now? Well, thinking outside the box. You know, looking at what's going on around you. Sometimes you need to to make changes. I mean, 
that's just the way we advertise, the way we promote our businesses. You know, you've got to be looking at what's working, changing times with all the technology. And, you know, nowadays with social media, we're putting a lot into that. We've never, never done that with our business before, but it's very successful with our racing to get the word out there. So now we're doing that with our automotive repair business. Yeah. Well, it makes me think about racers and having to have a certain mindset. Not everybody uh, uh, comes out uh, your first day on the track and they're a big time winners, right? There's these setbacks where you th- sometimes you even get a little bit overconfident. What do you tell a racer that's starting to get down to the dumps? You just got to suck keep, it up, buddy. <laughs> you, you, you know, mama said you'll have days like this. You, you've uh, you just, it fuels your fire. You know, you got to, once you, once you've won and done good, that usually is the, the brass uh, ring or the carrot out there that you're always working for. But you, you're not trying hard enough if you're not failing every now and then. Uh, it sure. seems oh, I like, like yeah, yeah. I mean, confidence, right. It's so, uh, it's so difficult to come by. It's so easy to lose. And I have to imagine, Doug, right. You've, mm-hmm. you've been doing this five years, but you've been in the business so long. You, you, you had the major medical setback and it, it gave you that chance to sort of regroup and decide what you want to be. Right. Has it been easy sailing since you, since you started your own deal? You know, I, again, like I said before, you know, it's a different set of uh, problems and issues and things like that. It all depends on the mindset, too. You know, there's going to be times when you do have to step back and take a run and make a flying leap. What I have found in, in, in a lot of things is that, you know, I, I believe very, very strongly in little changes, the compound effect. Right. And if you just you know, do this uh, unsexy, you know, l- improve a little bit every day type thing. It's amazing how progress feeds yeah. upon itself, exactly. right? Yeah. But there of- is times that you do have to, you know, you're at a crossroads and, you know, you go down this road, here's the best probability of what's going to happen. You go down this road. So sometimes you 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 got to take that step. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. as an entrepreneur, uh, sometimes we feel alone in these in these big decisions, right? It's like one way or the other. Uh, if I make the wrong one, it could put me out of business. I mean, maybe both are uh, are, are possibilities for uh, doom and gloom. Um, how do you go about making these decisions? I mean, is there somebody that stands by your side? Do you make them alone from your ivory, t- ivory tower? Well, I can see my wife, uh, you know, called you and make sure that I, you get that <laughs> uh, She's in, the CEO right. of, uh, of the, the Doug she's Wageman actually, life, huh? Yeah, the, yeah Doug Wageman Enterprises. <laughs> but, uh, you know, whether it's family, you know, and Bill, you know, has done a fantastic job surrounding himself with just top-notch people. you got to have the top-notch people. And you got to be careful who you are associating with on a day-to-day basis. Man, if you yeah. have the right people, you know, the ones with the, the right mindset and the same mindset, you know, they're going to encourage you along the way. Interesting. I mean, it's amazing how much the the right people, the, the people rub off on us, right? We're, we oh, end up becoming a lot like the people we spend the most time around. Who's in that world for you, Bill? Well, uh, there's there, if we're talking auto care, it's one group of people. But yeah. my wife does the books. She does ah. the deposits <laughs> and the receivables. She's an important piece to my business. Mm-hmm. But in family, my daughter works for me. My son works for me. It's great having the family be part of the business. But no matter what change you make, you need them all to buy into right. it or it's going to fail. And you've, you've got to explain it to them, get them to buy into it. And when they're in it, it's easy to go as an army. What's your mm-hmm. biggest failure? My biggest failure? I mean, we have them all the time. We'll be leading a race and have a right front go down and hit oh, the wall. Yeah. I mean, we've we've had some bad ones. We lost a championship last year. We ran the Canon East and the Canon West, the first team to ever lead the points in both series. And we got a, a right front flat at Dover, hit oh, the wall, and, and lost the championship to Harrison Burton in our last race. So, I mean, we have failures every day. Like I said, if you're not failing, you're not trying. And, and we, we're always trying a different spring combination, shot combination, always always looking for that edge and sometimes it's wrong but you always got your baseline to go back to yeah well one of your baselines here i mean i got my 68 camaro uh, replica <laughs> sitting here this is actually a 67 but it's this red convertible you guys uh one of your divisions fixed up my car my little uh, baby and put in i think fuel injection system and it runs like a champ i mean how's that division going that's not failing i hope no not at all not at all the, the race side we have 
that that's where we're trying stuff all the time. Yeah. The automotive care, we're pretty steady Eddie with that. Nice. We got good people. We we do the right things and uh, make our customers happy. Well, it, it makes me think so. about you, Doug, and your business. You're working in an industry where I would think uh, you said it was fun. You described it as uh, enjoyable, like a chess match. Which what are your next moves? What moves are coming for uh, Doug Wageman and company? Well, boy, I I'm really not sure. I think, I think part of being an entrepreneur and a business owner is keeping your eyes open for the opportunities, you know, and being willing to stop and take a look, you know, whether it's going to be a real estate thing or whether I'm going to buy another funeral home or start another, you know, entity. Um, we're always going to be looking at that, but we're always going to be wanting to, you know, meet the market where they're at and fill that need. So you whether bet. it's another cremation society in another area with a very high cremation rate, or maybe maybe it is doing something else. Maybe I start or maybe I buy a small cemetery and, and make it into a cremation garden. Hmm. You know, there's just... Well, what's a... Uh, yeah. you, you talked about the society. What is hmm. that? Well, it's, it, you know, it's historically, you know... Uh, you know, people would put money together in a society for burials. It used to be called burial societies. Um, early on in cremation, the names were Cremation Society, and it seemed to be more of an ambivalent and benevolent type of a name. Um, what I found when I was doing focus groups on name was they liked that aspect of it, but also... Placer County people are Placer County people. Okay. They like to do business in Placer County. They want County. to associate with I one another. I need to make sure that name was in there as well. Now, if I go out of the area, I might have to consider a more generic name for a different, you know, uh, cremation business. Well, we only have about so. a minute left, Bill. I got to ask you, though. You and I were talking during the break. Uh, Doug talks about keeping your, uh, keeping your eyes open and looking for new opportunity. You mentioned what's going on at the Placer County Fairgrounds. You're a part of something. Uh, why don't you touch on what the opportunity looks like? I mean, that, what's the vision for you out there at Placer County? Well, it's amazing. If you haven't been out there, they've renovated the two halls, Johnson and Jones Halls. They're putting $40 million worth of improvements in Placer wow. County Fairgrounds. It's now called The Grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Placer Valley Tourism has a 39-year lease, and it looks like uh, Bill McAnally Racing Promotions is going to take over all American Speedway. So. Exciting stuff yeah. right there in my hometown. This is, you know, Sacramento is, I think, all of our – uh, our town, but uh, I grew up in Roseville. We're gonna, I'm going to spend the rest of my days out there, I think, at some point. Um, and I've spent a lot of time at Jones and Johnson Hall in Placer County. So um, look forward to it. I want to thank you guys for coming on the show today. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to try to top you next week. I don't know how it's going to go. we got Lokesh Sakaria, Moneta Ventures coming on, along with Dr. Javid Sakiti of uh, Telemed to you. And then we've got Cameron Law, three guests next week of SVP. When it comes to social ventures, he is the law. When we come back, we'll share our takeaways, our closing thoughts about today's show um, and about that lost concept of failure. Failure is not an option. It is okay to refuse to lose. Join the revolution at HaneyBiz.com, brought to you courtesy of Ethan Conrad Properties and financial advisors, Stiefel Financial. This is the Haney Biz Project. <laughs> Welcome back for Mark's Takeaways from today's Haney Biz Project. Welcome back to the Haney Biz Project, brought to you courteous, courtesy of Silver's HR, Mark Haney, and I'm rejoined by Greg Van Dusen. We've been talking entrepreneurship. We've been talking to guys that know how to win, but have faced some difficult times. It hasn't always been easy. They found a way to uh, adapt, overcome, persevere. Greg, takeaways, closing thoughts? I love being around winners and warriors, you know? I mean, it's okay to lose. You know, my first job was in, it was in baseball. And in Major League Baseball, everybody wins a third and loses a third of their games. It's what you do with the rest. So, I mean, yeah. failure is part of it. It is. And you think about it. Baseball, I think, is the great uh, humbling, uh, humbler of, uh, of, of athletics, right? Because even in baseball, if you get up to bat and you bat 300, right, that's really good. But that means like 70% of the time uh, it didn't turn out so good. So, exactly. Just thinking about that. I, I love baseball. I love entrepreneurship. Uh, our guest, uh, Doug, this guy described his love uh, the, in the way that he loves to play chess, right? It, it's strategic at times, but I think when we begin to win, that confidence comes and it, becomes, it, it motivates us, I think, when we finally get over that hump. But sometimes it's not easy. A quick story here. Uh, 
of um, going through the financial crisis, right? So 2007, my businesses are, are kicking butt. Uh, 2008, uh, I am humbled. I am uh, almost brought to the knees, several layoffs, pay changes. We adapt and overcome through this good to great philosophy. Um, in 2009, we have uh, a great record year. 2010, actually was able to merge, sell the company, and have a, a tremendous uh, uh, exit. And uh, so as there I am thinking about what I'm going to do with my life. I'm helping through the transition of my old, of my old business, and it's growing. It's like up over $400 million and it's, you know, I've got the world by the tail, but my buddy uh, from Little League, Bob, he's not uh, doing so well, right? He's a construction guy. He owns uh, Placer Concrete Construction, and and in 2010, the, the building industry still hadn't quite recovered yet. And I get the call. Hey, Mark, uh, you know, you want to talk? And you know what? I think that was a turning point for Bob, right? He's going through probably the toughest. He had survived the toughest economic crisis um, since the Great Depression. But yet it's still at the tail end of that. And he finally decides to give his old buddy a call. And he says, hey, Mark, what do you think? And I'm like, I think I might. I got a little bit of a sales background, Bob. Maybe I'd come in there and help uh, help you out a little bit. And we partnered up and I uh, invested into his company. I invested though into Bob. I invested into Bob Garrison. I brought uh, my sales ability. It turned out I I sold a lot of stuff, but the timing, you know, our margins were no good at that time, and we were still battling for that first year. Finally, I exasperated. I went on and started chasing other startup ideas, but Bob didn't quit. Bob kept going. Here I am, the silent partner now. Bob is taking that concrete company, right? What was just plain old concrete to some people is a work of art to Bob Garrison. Stamped concrete, decorative concrete, ADA ramps, uh, foundations, flat work, all kinds of cool stuff. Bob's perseverance, right? Bob going through the toughest time that, uh, that we can imagine he decided not to quit. Even when his buddy comes in, the guy who is Mr. Entrepreneurship can't, uh, can't quite get him over the hump. He gets himself over the hump, right? It's that, I think a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we've got to just find a way to dig a little bit deeper. Find a way to get a small victory. I think Doug talked about it. Those, those little incremental wins, they, they, they build on each other and give us that confidence. And Bob's business today is going gangbusters, as is the, the industry, but Bob has turned it around. So I, it makes me... When I hear the stories of, of Doug and I hear the stories of Bill and, uh, and, I, and I think about my buddy uh, that I've been friends with since Little League, Bob Garrison, Placer Concrete Construction, right? I'm doing a little plug here for my buddy, but you know what? That's a guy that you want to do business with because he doesn't quit. If he makes a commitment, he keeps a commitment. And I think, that's what, I think that's what entrepreneurship is all about. If there's one core value that differentiates a successful entrepreneur from one that goes out of business at some point. It's the ability to commit, to never quit. Once you decide you're going to do something, even if that means you, you've you got to be a little bit humble, you bring in your old buddy from Little League to help you out a little bit. You know what? You do not quit. And I think that's the difference that is happening today in today's society is um, you know, as, as we think about failure is not an option, you don't hear that as much as we, as we did in the past. And so that's what I think this show is about, is about sharing those stories of those turning points where, where people dig a little bit deeper, figure out a way to win. So a little, uh, little shout out to all the entrepreneurs out there that are fighting the good fight for our freedom, our, our security, our way of life, all the, all the men and women in, in uniform, and all the entrepreneurs that are, that are doing it right here in Sacramento. Uh, shout out to you guys and a little toast. Uh, never above you. Never below you. Always, Always by, by your, your side. side.